Welcome to podcast number five, prepared by ProfWeb and Salties. This will be our last podcast for 2020 before the holiday break. I'm Ryan, an editor from ProfWeb.ca, and I'm joined by Kevin, a physics teacher from Vanier College, who is also a member of the Salties Active Teaching and Learning Community of Practice. Today, we are happy to be meeting with Sean Hughes, a chemistry teacher from John Abbott College, which is located in the West Island of Montreal, Quebec. In this podcast, we will be talking about evaluation strategies in a distance format and some of the tools and approaches that Sean has tried in the past couple of years. Would you please introduce yourself, name, department, and some of the courses you are teaching? Sure. So uh, my name is Sean Hughes. Um, I'm a chemistry teacher at John Abbott College. I'm also our Pathways Program Coordinator. That's the deck comp line. And uh, this semester I'm teaching Chemistry of Solutions NYB, but I've been involved in teaching the Chemistry NYA as well. Um, and I've taught uh, very often the mise en niveau courses as well for uh, high school equivalency. What evaluation strategies are you currently using for the fall 2020 semester? I'm part of a larger group that's teaching the same course, right? So at John Abbott, we often uh, try to use similar evaluation methods or, or test strategies in general in order to sort of make it sort of equitable for our students. And so this semester, what we've elected to do is do face-to-face -face exams. Uh, so we're doing three unit tests face-to-face -face, as well as the final exam. In terms of non-test materials, so maybe like quizzes or assignments, I'm primarily using Lon Kappa. Uh, to generate uh, some stuff. I, I used to dabble in Law and Kappa back when I was teaching the Mise Niveau courses and a little bit when I was teaching uh, Chemistry NYB a few years back. Um, our department switched over to Mastering Chemistry, so I kind of abandoned it. And when the pandemic came to be, uh, it so happened to coincide with our department moving to an online textbook. So I thought this was a good time to jump back into Law and Kappa once again and make mm -hmm. it sort of the primary vehicle for assignments. Um, and then in terms of our laboratories, um, it's sort of a bit of a 50-50 split this year, um, sort of eyeing that maybe we had a window of opportunity at the beginning of the semester, our department elected to do face-to-face -face labs, uh, which was interesting, uh, all socially distant, of course, um, and following the, the health and safety protocol set by the government. So it necessitated that um, half of our students be on campus during lab periods and that the other half had asynchronous activities to do at home. And then, Figuring towards the end of the semester, we might be back in a lockdown situation. Our department elected to do some at-home labs. Uh, some of it inspired by uh, some of the material uh, that Saltis generated, um, and some of it sort of more workshops or dry labs of our own design. Now, uh, could you tell us a little bit, Sean, uh, about uh, the different strategies you were using more in the 1920 uh, academic year? And uh, could you tell us about uh, some of the advantages maybe of those approaches that we, you were using uh, previously? I think the most interesting sort of strategy I, I used was with the tests when the, when the pandemic sort of came, came to be, right? And we were all in lockdown. And I think some of the fear uh, that most of us had was how am I going to assess my students in the way I normally assess in the classroom, but do it in this online medium? One is sort of just the logistics of, getting an exam to my students. How are they gonna write it? How are they gonna submit it? How are they gonna bring it back? How am I gonna evaluate it and give them back that feedback was part of the challenge too. But also I think, and this was at the forefront, I think of my mind and most of my peers' minds was how are we gonna stop these kids from cheating, right? What is, what is gonna constitute a fair assessment? And so all this was sort of swirling around in my head back in, uh, in March of this year. I became inspired by a methodology that I first probably saw presented to me back at a STELI conference, I want to say about seven or eight years ago. And then I was happy to see it actually uh, be presented also at Saltis, this idea of a, of a two-stage exam. And I had always been tempted to do a two-stage exam in class. And I was always sort of uh, fearful that if I didn't do it properly or design it properly, it could fail. And so I was always sort of hesitant to sort of take that leap. And then I felt this was the time to take that leap of faith. Uh, so for people who aren't sort of familiar with the two stage exam process, the idea is that um, students are given an individual test. They write that first, there's X amount of time to do it. And that basically is weighed for a certain proportion of your grade on that test. 
But then the same test is reissued to a group of students. Uh, usually maybe a, it could be a static work group. Usually that's what I've seen in the literature works best is that it's a group that already has built some trust foundation. And then they solve that test collectively. It's exactly the same test, right? And oftentimes what's seen in the literature is that not only do the students um, sort of benefit from that collaboration in the sense that they actually consolidate the information a little bit better. Anecdotally, students will say, oh, you know what, in discussing this with my peers, I realized I did something wrong on the individual test. Um, and so it's that kind of constructivist approach that it taps into, which is really, really nice. And what intrigued me about the model. But then what was even more interesting is that if you give a standard exam at the end of that course um, to students who have undergone sort of this uh, two-stage test system throughout the semester, and you give it that same final exam to students who uh, tackle it in a more individual basis, what often happens is the students who have experienced the tiered test system or the two-stage test actually outperform the students who do it individually, which was kind of neat. And this was always like attractive to me. It's like, wow, learning during a test, who knew? Um, so knowing full well that my students were probably going to collaborate on any test that I gave them at a distance. I figured why not let them collaborate, let them quote cheat, let it be open book, um, but under sort of my conditions, which is we already had static work groups, the students had already worked with each other in class. Um, but I also knew I didn't want to give them the same test necessarily because the sort of questions that we tend to ask on our unit tests tend to be sometimes a little bit more cookbook right, kind of, you know, plug and chug questions. I try to avoid those as best as I can. I'm very curious about how, like, the, like, perhaps the level or style of questions differed from the, like, the traditional, as you say, like, cookbook. If you could maybe compare and contrast those, uh, those a little bit more in terms of, um, like, designing questions, uh, getting the content for those questions. I wanted to see what my students understood, right? Like, do they get the big picture, the overarching concept, right? I tend to, in class, tend to ask questions that are less reliant on, you know, a, like a plugging a number into a formula, you know, that never really tests true understanding sometimes, right? Um, I really wanted to get at, like, do you understand the science of what we're doing now, like what the course I was teaching was our general chemistry course. So it leans a lot on atomic theory. And that was the test that I was dealing with. It was um, the Schrodinger model of the atom, uh, orbital configurations, uh, behaviors, electrons in the atom. I believe there was elements of periodicity in there as well. Um, we looked at the ionic bonding model um, and also the bonding models for molecular compounds. What I elected to do actually in taking this leap of faith with this two-stage test was I actually designed the first test to be very concept heavy. Like, so no particular um, specific context. I'll give you an example. You know, something that might've appeared on my, on my old unit test was, we'll write the electron configuration for such and such an element mm. or such and such an ion. Well, that's out the window because I know they can Google it. But if I can now get to the heart of like, well, how do you, how do you come up with that electron configuration? That's what I'm more interested in. So, so but, it's uh, more about the competency, how, yes. how the skill of doing it rather than the, like, the end result necessarily. Absolutely. It really was about the competency, right? Let's, let's get to the root of like, do you truly understand something? Could you apply it in a novel context? So really in a way, what I wanted to address in my first test was less the specifics, but more in general, how would you approach solving a problem of this nature in this course. If the context was electron configuration, how would you maybe go about coming up with the electron configuration for elements? Um, if you were talking about periodicity, this ended up being the first question was I really wanted to know, like, do you understand trends? So in, in the standard chemistry textbook, you go across a period, it does this, you know, atoms get smaller, ionization energies increase. Again, this is information you can find quite handily. And that information's there, whether I like it or not, it's, it's open book. Um, but if I can give them a novel context or just a general context and say, well, what are the factors that really affect that? Well, now I'm getting at the root cause of why the periodicity exists in the first place. So rather than test, do you understand, do you know the trend? I want to know if you really understand it. So it really was getting at the root of like, what do you understand about this concept? And that was challenging for the students, admittedly. Um, 
when I was grading some of those exams, oftentimes we would come out with like a huge brain dump, right? They just kind of throw information at you because they're not quite comfortable with how they answer it. But the students who really understood it um, were able to synthesize really well thought out answers in, in a very small amount of space, right? So I'd get pages from some students and I get like nice concise answers that really hit exactly what I was looking for. Right. What does periodicity depend on? It depends on how electrons interact with the nucleus, how the electrons interact with other electrons in the same shell or in smaller shells or in larger shells. That's 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 what I wanted to get at. And so it was really, really general questions in the individual components. And so I was testing probably if I if I steal like Bloom's taxonomy, like we're we're talking higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy mm -hmm. here. We're not at the redundant, you know, like the understanding and the remembering. We're really in the apply. We're really in the analyze. Um, and in some cases, there's elements of creation in there as well. Ultimately, when I bring it back to the team test, now I give them a little bit more specific context. So it's stuff that maybe you can find, but but something unique. So you know, I know full well in the periodic table, there's you know, there's a whole bunch of radioactive elements. There's, there's not much you'll find online about the radioactive elements because, you know, who cares about their electron configurations? Um, so I told them, well, here's the context is you, you, you have this undiscovered element that falls in to this area of the periodic table. Tell me about it. Give me what you think its electron configuration. Tell me what you think its properties will be relative to these other elements in the same group or in the same period. And I think that really tested true understanding. Because there's nothing you could Google. It's nothing you could just look up. You had to really think about it and apply the knowledge um, and apply the competency. That's what it was. It was apply the, you know, show that you understand this competency. It really wasn't sort of like your traditional test. So I think if, if I had advice for anybody who was designing an online assessment, um, it would be you have to think about the bigger picture. You can't think about the minutia anymore. The minutia you're going to find online minutia you're going to find in your textbook. It can't be those standard problems you find in the back of the textbook. It's got to be something that uh, tries to assess a level of depth of understanding. And, and that worked out really well for me. I was actually really surprised to see the kinds of answers that the students were able to generate on that test. Um, it was quite surprising. I think for myself as a teacher, coming up with those questions, which are quite a bit in a way, they're the same, but the style is so different to, and yep. the context is different. Uh, how, um, uh, like, is there maybe um, like a uh, like location where you would, could recommend that teachers could go looking for the sort of questions that would be suitable? Or um, is it just everyone for themselves? That's an excellent question. Um, I mean, I think part of what I had to do, first of all, when I was moving to more of that online context was I, I knew I had to kind of prepare my students mentally for what I was expecting, right? So you don't go give a test if you're teaching at a different level, right? It's not fair. Uh, so I think I put a lot more emphasis on the overarching concepts during class time, whether it was through lecture, whether it was through mm -hmm. activities. So it's some elements of scaffolding there. So at least I, I get or, or emphasis of the things that I wanted to see them do. In terms of resources, I mean, I, I tried to tap in, into my own prior knowledge. That's number one. Um, I, I, I always have at the back of my mind uh, some advice that was given to me by my colleague, Andrew Brown, which is, is this something that a scientist would do? And if it's not something a scientist would do, why are we testing it? And so I always kind of keep that in the back of my mind too, right? Is sort of what, what is useful? What is practical? What is really how a scientist would think and apply knowledge? And that sort of becomes my inspiration for how I would design these test questions. To that end, uh, you know, talking to your colleagues, right? And bouncing some ideas. A, a lot of too, what I've picked up on in terms of assessment was also from some um, experience sitting in on master teacher program courses. Uh, and there are courses that they offer on assessment and I've, I've kind of de facto audited them uh, many a time. And so you kind of pick up these ideas there sort of um, organically or from attending conferences. So I can't really say I have a specific repository of, of where I kind of get that inspiration or those ideas. You know, if I think of another sort of inspiration, if you will, it actually comes from the, the um, you know, the Quebec education program, the reform, right? Was that in the high schools, they were gravitating less 
away from sort of these these traditional sort of tests that they do and looking more at these larger learning and evaluation situations right where there was like these big picture problems and that i think was probably also in the back of my mind thinking what's the big picture problem here what are the big picture problems that these students can maybe solve or tackle you know in in this in this context right of whatever it is i'm teaching um and so some of it comes from there too right um i think it's bringing in those multiple pieces, those multiple sort of bits of information, and then letting them coalesce in, into a larger problem. So um, Ryan actually mentioned that uh, I imagine it's actually quite challenging for your students to when perhaps they're not always uh, used to thinking like that. How would you say that your students have reacted to the two approaches you've mentioned? So after the test, I made a point of touching base with them, right? So I did like a, a little classroom assessment and I sent them a little survey. One was to kind of get a sense of how engaged were they in the process uh, of the test, the collaboration and what their experiences were on the individual component. Um, and one of the questions I asked them was, did you enjoy this test format, first of all? Like, was this palatable for you? Um, and I think, I'm trying to remember the survey response now, if it was 34 students responded, but I think 30 out of 34 students basically said it was a positive experience mm. and that they really enjoyed it, which, which shocked me because who enjoys a test, right? And looking at the feedback, it seemed like they were engaged. When I asked them like, well, what did you do? How did you participate in this? They would tell me, well, you know, we did this test individually and then we thought about it and then we got together and compared our answers and we had discussions and it was nice to actually feel like I was learning something. Um, I felt like I was learning more as a result. Um, I was testing or getting information about things I did not understand from my peers telling me, you know what, no, this is the angle you should have looked at. Um, so for them, what was interesting about it too is they were reporting a positive learning experience that happened during the test. It certainly wasn't unanimous. I don't think it was comfortable for all my students. The, the survey was anonymous, but the one student I, I worried about who was in my class was a student who, who presented himself on, on, on the autism spectrum. And I was very worried about this because this is probably a test format he had never experienced. He was okay socially with his group, um, but I was very concerned for him. Um, and I, I suspect maybe some of the feedback I got that was negative might have come in part from him. Because there was one student who said, like, I really did not like this format. It was, I, I had a hard time wrapping my head around it. And I may just be projecting. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm also cognizant that this methodology does not necessarily suit all, right? Um, but overall, the, the, the feedback was extremely positive. Um, and, and I, I sit on our student success committee at John Abbott and I had to give myself a self high five after this uh, focus group we ran. Uh, so we brought in students from different programs um, to kind of talk about their experiences during the pandemic. What was it like learning online? What was it like being evaluated online so that we could not, you know, that we could move forward in the fall and not repeat the, you know, the mistakes that we made in, in, in that rush to get online back in March. And one of the students happened to be uh, one of my students from my class. And she said, I have to tell you guys about the best exam I've ever taken in my life. Mm. You know, for a student to kind of stand up and say, you know what, that was a really great learning experience, not just a test experience, but a learning experience. That was positive for me. And, you know, what are we in this business for if, if it's not for the learning? And sometimes we get lost in the grades and the R scores and the whatnot. And we tend to lose sight of some of us that, that, Part of what we're doing is we're trying to teach them. What attracted me to this methodology that I use was that, and that's what the, the researchers were saying, was that the students who participate in this report that they're learning more. They're learning more as a process of doing that collaboration on the test. And um, it worked out really well for me, I have to say. And it seemed to work out well for my students. Uh, about like the, the mechanics of the test. Yes. If you like, I mean, in terms of timing, uh, how big were the groups? Like, correct me if I'm wrong, this, they were doing this online, right? Correct. So how, like, uh, just the mechanics of how, how do they submit that sort of thing? So. Okay. So that's a really good question. Um, cause it, it was labor intensive on my part. Okay. I have to admit. So part of the challenge was, um, and I think most 
faculty were cognizant of this. The message early on from, from our academic dean was don't go crazy, first of all, right? That, that this is sort of emergency response teaching. I, I only think it was even coined that term at the, at the time, but, but go easy on, on, on the students in the sense that don't go grabbing 50 new platforms to bring into your classroom because it's just, it's going to be too much for the students. And that's certainly something that we heard in our focus group at the Student Success Committee was that students had a hard time reconciling the number of programs now that they had to use, websites they had to reference, where would they find information? Was it on Leia? Was it on Teams? This teacher was using Zoom. So I really tried to stick to the platforms that our college was endorsing and supporting, which were primarily the Microsoft Office package and Leia, uh, Omnibox. So I need I needed to think about logistically, one, how was I going to get this test to the students in a fair way? But two, and, and this was part of the test design too, was I, I still inserted a, uh, an element of randomness so that students still had a unique test. I wasn't using Lawn Kappa at the time. So what I elected to do is really do everything in the Microsoft Office package, okay, which has pluses and minuses. So I basically compiled a spreadsheet in Excel with variables that I would put into a Word document. And then I would use the mail merge feature in Microsoft Word to basically auto-generate all these exams hmm. and also be able to email it out to the students because they all have a Microsoft Office email account. So it actually made the logistics of distributing the exam fairly easy. Um, and then it, it gave me that option of incorporating that randomness so that if they did want to cheat on the individual portion, well, go waste your time finding out who has a very similar test question to you. It, and there wasn't enough time. So the, the synchronous portion, which was individual, lasted an hour. And then I gave them 15 minutes to fight with the machine to submit it online. And I had it done through the um, a Leia Dropbox. Uh, so that worked well. I had the odd student that maybe had a, a few technical issues, but it worked relatively well. And the nice thing too about that was, um, you know, I gave them the option of you could print it out and write it out, your answers. You could just write out your answers on a sheet of paper. Don't even bother printing the exam. Um, and then they just had to collate that into a PDF and, and send that to me and it was done. So that was the logistics for that portion. During the individual portion of the test, I then sent out the team test. And the nice thing about the team test was I, when I was creating the randomized individual tests, I tried to at least give similar context if there was a context to people who I knew were in the same group. So like I said, my guys had static work groups from the beginning of the semester, I knew who they were going to work with and who they were going to collaborate with on the on the online portion. And so I sent that to them and I said, you can do this asynchronously over the next couple of days. So I gave it, I think, 48 hours. Um, however, I did devote two hours of lab time for them to get together. So I didn't have any of these, quote, dog ate my homework excuses, right? And the team portion was designed to be really a two-hour test. So if you couldn't get together in between test A and the team test, well, at least in the classroom, in that live synchronous portion, you had a chance to work with people because you were all going to be there at the same time. So it did take time resources in the sense of my having to front load a lot of the work to generate the, the, the schema, to, to generate these exams, to test it, to troubleshoot it. Um, it did work, which was great. For the students, it was sort of, I think, What's important for students is sort of priming them, maybe testing with them how you're going to do that test. It's uh, something I didn't do, like how you're going to distribute it. I didn't have too many hiccups with the distribution. Um, how they're going to submit, that was a bit of a barrier, right? I don't know how to scan this test, sir, that I wrote on paper. So, you know, giving them some sort of um, tools to do that. Cam Scanner or Adobe Scan really work really well on phones. So that, that's what I've used this semester when I need them to scan stuff. Um, and then the team portion, it was very easy. They had that synchronous class time, um, but it did eat up the, that that face-to-face -face time, right? So uh, if you are going to go in this direction, recognize that you're going to have to devote some time resources to doing it. I could see like in hindsight, if I was designing this in Moodle, th there may be an easier way right, um, to auto-generate some of that stuff and make something unique or in some other platform. But for me at that time, working with the MS Office package seemed to be the path of least resistance for ensuring my students were working within the platform that we were already using in class. 
Was there anything that you wanted to show us uh, in relation to the evaluations or? Okay, so this is an example of what I would have done on the individual components. So first things first was to give them the general instructions. I believe I gave them the instructions ahead, the instructions ahead of time as well. So they didn't have to read these when the test started, they were able to hit, kind of hit the ground running. Um, you know, like I said, it was open book. You could use whatever resource you wanted except another person. Um, so let's take the first question here. It was, um, again, this was a question I think on periodicity. So if you were to compare the periodic properties of element AA, so th this was the first variable, the first variation, right? Um, and they would get some random element number, something that was radioactive. So something that you're not gonna find information on readily on the internet. This was all theoretical, right? Um, to its nearest neighbors in the periodic table, how would you go about doing so? Um, so I give them something that was in the F block um, on the radioactive side of things. Um, you know, what are the key features of the atom that impact its periodic properties relative to other elements? So it's very general question, right? Very open-ended. Um, you're probably not gonna find that answer online, right? You kind of have to know your stuff. Um, how are these features are sim uh, similar or different amongst atoms in the same group? And then um, the random element for the follow-up question is how are they similar or different for things that are in the same period or if they are isoelectronic, right? So really what I was trying to look for from the student was again, it's this idea that the electrons have an interplay with the nucleus and the electrons have interplay with themselves and it's that balance between, between both those things. Um, so very general context, yes, a little bit of something specific for them to hang on to, but overall, I wanted something general, right? I think the thing to note to here too in the question design is I'm not asking a completely different random question in the same sort of context. Um, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, here, how would you go about constructing a Bornhaber cycle for an ionic compound? What data do you need? Construct a generic Bornhaber cycle applicable for any compound. So I don't care what it is. You tell me what you need to think about. Um, so again, very general context. Everyone got the same question. Um, but again, it's sort of tell me what you know. Um, and I wasn't expecting perfect answers. That's the other thing. I wasn't expecting perfect answers. Just show me that you know something and that you have a level of knowledge that I feel like you know my gut feeling tells me, you know what, you seem to know your stuff, okay? And even if you forgot one tiny detail, it's not the end of the world. So how did you grade these? Ah, okay, so, good. A question so this me. was the other thing I gave my students, was I gave them the rubric I was using on the individual portion. Um, and I, I was inspired by Phoebe Jackson years ago. She, she kind of put me onto rubrics, and I've used a lot of rubrics ever since, just never really in a test context. This was the first time I was able to really bring it into a test context. But I basically had two general criteria. Did you understand the concept, or three, sorry? Did you apply it properly? And then I wanted to see some level of writing, right? Because I think we sometimes undervalue writing in the sciences. And I wanted to make sure that were you able to string this together in a coherent way, or were you just slap dashing things from your notes, right? Um, and so really this grading rubric was applicable to any of the aforementioned questions that I had designed and regardless of the randomized context, you know? So did you really understand the concept being tested? Was your answer relevant? Was it thoroughly explained? Do you have independent thought, right? Was there a strong personal understanding, right? So this is what I was looking for, right? If you gave me examples or the procedures that you came up with, were they relevant? Or were you just, again, slap dashing things from your notes? And that's what I had. I had a lot of students that just brain dumped a whole lot of things from their notes. Well, they weren't going to get the top grades. You know, when we designed sort of uh, sometimes a grading rubric for a traditional test, and I was certainly guilty of this when I first started as a teacher, it's you're going to hang one mark on if they say this. And you're going to hang two marks on if they say that. Oh, and if they said this, oh, well, we're going to knock off two marks, right? And, and sometimes it pigeonholes you and you could see all the buzzwords are there, but there's no understanding. And that used to irritate me as a teacher, right? And so I think that the beauty of sort of looking at grading this with a rubric is that you're really testing for understanding was show me what you understand about this. Show me that you're applying it properly and that you can do this in a very coherent and logical way, right? So that was sort of the individual portion. And then on the team test, um, and again, sort of this is where I strayed from what the traditional model is that I've seen presented to me about the two-stage test is that usually give the same test. Well, here, 
what I tried to do with the individual test was prime the student to think about how they would apply their knowledge. And then in this context here, now let's apply it. So go apply it with your teammates. Make sure first you're all on the same page and then go and apply it. So again, think of periodic properties. So you have this, you all had the same element. Uh, how would you rank its atomic size in this group or period? How would it be for its ionization energy or electron affinity? So things I didn't necessarily ask on the first test, but very much related more into the specifics. Um, and then they can have a discussion on that and, and come to a consensus about what they think the right answer is. Um, similarly, um, for the born hover, hover cycle, so um, you know you have this element that's pairing up with your fictitious element. Come up with the born hover cycle. What are the different steps? Um, and again, because I can play around with some of the bits and bobs of what it's reacting with, and uh, it changes maybe what the compound will be at the end. So everybody, every group, more or less had a unique born hover cycle. But again, I can grade it on the same rubric if I really wanted to. It's do you really get it? Right? Did you apply things properly? And so that actually made the element of correcting less tedious because I was looking for a bigger picture, do you understand? And I think that's something powerful that um, I often am guilty myself of not tapping into on a test, but after this experience, it's something that I'm definitely doing more of. The only thing I can yeah. think of that I haven't talked about is how I weighted, weighted the assessment. I want to say the individual was 60% and the team portion was 40%. Um, and I think one of the things I've seen in most two-stage exams is that oftentimes teachers will um, design it so that if your team portion ends up less than your individual portion, you can't be penalized. And I had a good-natured group, but I didn't want to run that risk of you're going to go and sandbag your team so that you know your individual test score is stronger than your team and you benefit on your R score. So I wanted to make it quite clear that this was collaborative and you had to collaborate in a positive way. Um, and I think the 60-40 split kind of helped with that too, right? I wonder if I would reweigh it in the future, maybe like a 70-30. I, I have to tinker around with that, but it, it seemed to work well for my students. I really had no problems with or complaints about the weighings. Tess, when I do teamwork in my class, it's often very low stakes work uh, cause students get very uptight about that, right? Is that my mark all of a sudden depends on whether or not my other teammates are doing something and working right. well. And I had a few hanger ons in those sections, right? Uh, in that section of the course or in some teams. Um, but I felt it, it did not pose a problem when I pitched it at them at first. I didn't see from the feedback post test that anyone said, oh, this guy really didn't do anything. It seemed as if everybody universally really contributed to the final product, which was nice to see. So thanks to Sean Hughes for joining us today and for sharing a couple of evaluation approaches. These will certainly help our viewers reflect on their own approaches and the tools that they are using. For our viewers, please feel free to add some of the evaluation strategies you are using in the comments area of the Prof Web page where you are viewing this video. So thanks again, Sean. Thank you for having me.